the Pac-Man sound when you run to one of the ghosts. Hi everybody, I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And today we have a special guest who we've been, we've been completely ignoring for the past 10 seconds. Oh, hi! Hi! I'm AY. They, they can see you. Oh. Except for those of you <laughs> listening who can't. Yes. Hi, I'm AY. Yes. And our topic today is race. Specifically race together. The new Starbucks campaign that has now been going on for a couple of weeks. Two, I think. Yeah. So icebreaker. Because this is going to be heavy. What is your favorite thing to not buy at Starbucks? I'm going to go first because I'm the guest. Yeah, by all means. My favorite thing to not buy at Starbucks... I don't know, I'd have to say Justice. You can't buy Justice at Starbucks. They don't you sell can't it. buy Justice anywhere, actually. Justice isn't for sale. Okay, 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 that's fair, that's fair. My favorite thing to not buy at Starbucks would definitely be tea. Like, individual servings of, like, cups of hot tea. I know it's completely ridiculous, but I just, I can't pay... Like, it's exponentially cheaper to make your own tea at home, and I just I hate paying the $3 to have somebody else make it for me, even though I know people need to be compensated for their labor. So well, I just, just don't. Hot water and it's just hot water. It's just hot water. And, like, a, two tablespoons of milk. I'm not going to pay $3 for that when I can buy, like, 50 of them, and I've turned to my mother, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> All right. Hot go. Uh, I'd say my favorite thing to not buy at Starbucks is the cult of what they call their cups, the yeah. sizing. Okay. Um, because he does not understand the genius of oh, it. I can't, oh. I can't keep it straight in my head, and this is probably just because I was born in, and raised in the backwater woods of Tim Hortons <laughs> and McDonald's and everything else where it's small, medium, and large. <laughs> and so then I go to Starbucks and I get confused by the fancy names and when I think I'm getting the largest thing for the latte and I only ever order one latte because I don't order anything else there I buy the one called tall thinking that it's the largest size because it's tall and ends up being the smallest size you ever wonder it's not the a, smallest size I know. do you ever wonder if that's a tall person problem like you are tall and so you assume that it, the tall is going to be the biggest Potent that's tallest potentially but I don't know, it just made sense at the time until I got the cup, and I'm like, that's not what I want at all. It's also not the smallest size. The I smallest know. size is the short. But who <laughs> buys shorts? Um, kids' size drinks um, come in short, and also, too, um, apparently in um, East Asia, getting short is, like, really, really common. It's actually a very Western thing to get, like, humongous amounts of milk with only two shots of espresso. Are there, I a, think lot it's of, more. Are there a lot of kids' beverages at Starbucks? You can get any um, non-espresso-based drink made as a kid's drink. Okay. Because the kid's only means that it's deemed to, um, like, lukewarm instead of hot. I was actually less also concerned. cheaper. I was less concerned about the temperature, actually. I'm a horrible person. I'm more about the caffeine content. <laughs> oh! <But, laughs> no, they just make it like lukewarm. Anyway. Okay. So you can get a kid's hot chocolate, but then ask them to make it extra hot. And then you just get, like, a small hot chocolate, but it only costs you $1.50. The AY is our ringer here on the question of race in Starbucks. I don't like paying full price! She used to work at Starbucks. <laughs> Most cheap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so you guys have all that stories. My, mine is um, mine is less interesting. I, I don't drink coffee, so if I'm there, I usually get a $4 orange juice because I'm an idiot. <laughs> um, my favorite thing to not buy at Starbucks is biscotti. Because biscotti, I have learned, is basically Italian for crappy cookie. Literally baked twice. Is that what it means? <laughs> Literally. Okay, I don't know why you would bake a cookie twice, but tell, uh, trust Twinkle me. Twinkle crispy! Trust me when I tell you that after you bake it the second time, it tastes like shit. <laughs> to make it crispy. It's crispy the first time. Or you just cook it longer the first time. Yeah. No, 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 because with the way biscotti is made, I don't know why you are both so uncultured. Biscotti is made as sheets, uh -huh. and then after it's baked the first time, it's cut into those shapes, uh -huh. flipped onto the side, and baked a second time in order to dry it out and make it crisp. Okay, so here, spoilers. I also make cookies on sheets, <laughs> and I bake them once, they're full of chocolate. <laughs> And 
it tastes really good. I thought you were going to say you bake them once and they're always fucking dry. <laughs> Listen, all right? I thought that's what... Critique... This thought is that's not what... the baking podcast. Don't critique my baking skills. <laughs> I just thought that that's where that was going. I was like, look, I use sheets, I cook ba- cookies, and they come out drier than the Mojave the first time I cook them. I'm just saying, if if you got it right the first time, you would have to bake it twice. Nice desert choice, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people are usually Sahara. I would have gotten out of comma, but, yeah. but I like I, it. Uh, don't be hipsters about your desert choices. <laughs> Anyway, God. no, we're actually here to talk about something serious, which is which is the Race Together campaign, which is, uh, I believe the, the word that we used earlier was terrible. Um, horrific. Monstrous. Misguided. Ridiculous. That's terrible of you. Yeah, poorly I, I, thought out. So, so, so briefly, w- what is it? Someone explain it to me like I'm five. All right, sweetheart. Do you remember when you asked the other day why sometimes... Bad things happen to good people. Okay, explain it to me like I'm a little older. Oh, okay. You said five. Uh, I'm infantilizing. <laughs> I'm precocious. <laughs> um, and then after you asked why do bad things sometimes happen to good people, I told you that sometimes people think money can fix every problem. Yes. Is that a little bit older? Because I feel like now yeah, we have no, to like... Yeah, we're, we're doing well. We're okay, doing okay, well. okay, like okay. okay. Um, so Starbucks thinks that buying a beverage is the perfect opportunity to have really complex and sophisticated discussions about structural and systemic injustice. Okay. And Oh, and then they used to put stickers on the cup that said race together, but now they don't as of today. No longer do that. Yeah, they claim that that was the it was the natural end to that part of the campaign. I don't know. We always plan to end it on March twenty second, regardless yeah. of the feedback we got on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna start it on the business. The business week. Look, look, stickers are expensive, and we only printed so many of them. So listen. We only have so much cash. Yeah. So we're going to Also, it turned stickers. out that when people were calling out the names of Race Together, uh, they forgot to write people's coffee like names on them for their coffee. So a lot of people wind up with ra- with different Race Together coffees, and they don't. Oh. But yeah, so Lord I mean, forbid having to talk to somebody else to figure out what drink you got. Look, all right, I don't miserable. go to Starbucks to talk to people, um, which is <laughs> what makes the campaign extra weird, is because it. Um, I would use the, I would tentatively use the word encourages Starbucks employees to write race together on a cup and explore and, and, and have a conversation about race with customers. And th- there's a lot, of, there's a lot of problems with that. I, just realized I was about to interrupt you, I'm oh. sorry. Go, no, but I'm, no, I'm interrupting you. No, you go first. You I'm going to interrupt myself. I was going to say that it licenses um, the baristas to bring up race. Mm-hmm. Because I think before the Race Together initiative, I think the accepted protocol of um, barista comportment, barista behavior, um, was that you don't offend the um, customers. And so I think what's really interesting is that um, because of, because you're not supposed to offend the customers, you don't really talk about race. But now, with Race Together, you're still not supposed to offend the customers, but now you're expected to talk about race, which I think is a really interesting dynamic. You still can't upset anybody, but now, but now talking <laughs> you're allowed this, to tackle this subject. Well, and you're, 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 you're encouraged to. Like, like the, the thing that I, I just occurred to me is that this is the kind of thing that managers would conceivably have to train their staff for. And I feel like that training session is super awkward. <laughs> I guess a manager, you're like, and now we will get to the other portion of our training where sometimes you can write it on a cup. Sorry, I can't hear you. I'm in the back. I can't. What was that? I can't. Um, the race to another portion of our training where you can discuss systemic issues of oppression with our clearly enlightened clientele. Yeah, I mean, it's... I, and. Actually, not to disparage the, the clientele of Starbucks, who I don't doubt are noble people. I'm still a clientele of Starbucks. Yeah, see? There you go. I still have my specialty um, it is, cards. It is, it, is, it is more that, I mean, the sort of hubris of thinking that a conversation, or many conversations, between two individuals in a fucking Starbucks 
can fix a systemic issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm just imagining Michael Scott trying to do the Starbucks <laughs> training for, like, trying to train the employees on how to talk to customers about it. Well, you don't want to mark the minimum. Just have, we had to do the minimum of, of race together in yeah. cups. You need to you need to have a lot of flair. Yeah. I didn't. I only watched like four episodes of The Office, so I'm aware of the reference you're trying to make. I just don't. Just, and I know it would be funny if I watched the show. All it is is just imagine somebody who tries to have a good intent. But has all of the wrong examples. So oh, speaking Howard of machine, Schultz. Yeah, speaking of CEO, sorry, <laughs> yeah. it's Howard Schultz. Um, you were about to say something about Howard Schultz. I have a lot of things to say about Howard Schultz. A lot of things to say to Howard Schultz. I feel as though I should contextualize my feelings about Starbucks a little bit, or a lot of it, because I feel as though it matters. Okay. Um, I used to work at Starbucks, and it paid my rent a roof over my head. Um, I had health insurance, stock options, um, what else did I have? Free drinks, free food. Um, it was great when I didn't get enough hours in order to both pay rent and buy food. I could accidentally drop some inventory and have that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So that was great. Um, so insofar as it was sustenance for a significant period of my life, um, I think I'm expected to feel indebted to them, expected to feel a sense of loyalty. And I think that the Starbucks machine is really actually very skilled at producing a sense of employee, or as they call them, partner loyalty. Um, and this loyalty is supposed to be aimed at Howard Schultz and the Starbucks mission and vision. Um, the training videos, when you get hired, one of the training videos is actually Howard Schultz, a recording where he says, hi, welcome new partner to Starbucks. Um, we're so happy to have you here. Like it's like, he's talking into the camera as though he's talking to you. And it's just this faux personalization. And I think that if you did not know how to separate the rhetorical devices <laughs> out from the content, it's really actually very easy to buy into the message of Howard Schultz as a noble leader forward into the future. Um, every like staff meeting, um, there was like, like annual district meetings, there'd be like a video of Howard Schultz like talking and pepping you up and blah 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 blah. Um, I don't know if they still do this by the way, this is just what I remember from like our district-wide Christmas meeting of watching a video about Howard Schultz giving us like Christmas, like holiday seasons greetings. Mm -hmm. And just the absolute farce of the chief executive officer of day-to-day -day operations overseeing a multi-billion dollar corporation pretending to have a personal one-on-one um, -on -one connection with each and every partner. Like the absolute farce of that. I guess it plays into that notion too that, that it's that it's that kind of farce that enforces this kind of emotional labor. I mean, there's a sense in which if I am buying a coffee <coughs> or a four dollar orange juice or God forbid a biscotti <laughs> and bake twice like my, it's supposed to. my my person who is serving me this thing says, "Hey, would you like to have a conversation about race?" Like, I mean. I am probably down for that, but I am weird. But I am also somewhat uncomfortable. But the amount of discomfort that I experience in, in that conversation probably has absolutely nothing on theirs. Because they have to smile and be happy and do... Like, like, in addition to smile and be nice to people, which is the standard sort of customer service emotional labor, where smile all day, be, you know, and, and smile genuinely... Mm -hmm. And be happy because people mm -hmm. know when you're not when you're just like hi, oh, yes. oh god. They demand not just a smile but authenticity. Yeah, and and so on top of that, now also be an expert on this thing, um, and have conversations with people about it, uh, no matter how uncomfortable that makes you feel. I kind of want to interject, but I feel as though you haven't said anything in a little. No, while. no, feel free to interject. That's well, fine. what I wanted to say is, I actually would 
object to one part of what you just said okay. is that the expectation about the conversation is not that the barista become an expert on race and this I think is the problem that we expect um, that because everybody has a race everybody is therefore um, knowledgeable about um, and I'm, I'm just gonna say this out and then refine it later that because everybody has a race um, everybody is entitled to whatever opinion they have about race. Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't think you're entitled to, I think you're entitled to your opinion, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're, just because you have a race, your opinion is well formed, or that your opinion, um, matters. or your perspective, <laughs> no, it, doesn't, it doesn't even mean that like it matters, it's that, it's this idea that as long as you can project yourself into the question at hand, you have something valuable to contribute, positive to contribute. In this narrative, there is no such thing as a negative contribution. And I think that you have to have a an absurd, and I mean absurd is in like pushing a boulder up a mountain, having it roll down the next day, and then pushing it back up again the next day for all of eternity, absurd view of what progress is to think that there is no such thing as a negative conversation about race. So no, I don't think Starbucks is expecting to, to be experts and that is the problem. Yeah, expecting no, that's a good point. Non-experts they're, to they're, 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 they're expecting that non-expert conversations are sufficient. Because it's this idea that there's no, it's, it's almost as though they don't think that there's any kind of thing as to expertise about race. Yeah, if you have watched Remember the Titans. <laughs> you know everything. You just did, know in your heart. Did you watch an episode of Roots one time? <laughs> yeah. You're you're down with it. Yeah. But I have so many feelings and thoughts. Aren't I entitled to express them? No. <laughs> I mean, yes, on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, no. I mean, I mean, you, there there are all there are all kinds of uh, manners of you where you, where people can have feelings and thoughts and yet not be entitled to express them. Catcalling, for instance, mm. is probably the, that's a whole other podcast. It's, uh, in a non, um, well, not the catcalling is not arbitrary, but in a just recent case, uh, what was it? The McGill students or the Carlton students? The two, the two, I believe they were white students. Um, they were reporters uh, or journalists. For oh, the paper, who um, went, went that was Ryerson. Ryerson. That was at Ryerson. Ryerson. Okay, uh, they we'll went to the article in the show notes. Yeah, they where they went into a space. Can now, we put a link over his face? No. Oh yeah. Well, well, we we can't put it on YouTube link over his face. Yeah. Oh. Uh, the rules of YouTube, but um, it, it's kind of funny because I read the the Globe and Mail article and I read it and it's like okay, the two who went there realized that they were in the wrong space and they left when they were asked and everything was fine and i thought okay that's cool like and then all of a sudden that, uh, there was all these other articles that came out and all the comment section commentary that came out about reverse racism and stuff and i'm like i can see why you're saying all these things in the comments but i don't think it's a like what happened was actually a very positive experience. The students understood why they had to leave. It was not an open event. It was an event specifically to discuss these issues, and they were not there to contribute, and they were there as journalists. It makes sense that it was not a space that, that, that they were entitled to sit in on. Um, mm. And yet, that was not what the point of the story that got spread around on social media was. And I just, I was like, why, why is this a thing? I mean, I know why it's a thing, but why is it a thing? If that makes any sense, I, I, I that think makes I, sense. I think you hit the right word with entitlement. They yeah. are in. They feel you know, like there's a sense that they should be entitled to sit in on that. In the same way that, I mean, dudes sometimes feel entitled to go to women's centers. I mean, we we actually, if I can put a link over over Huck's face, we did a video about this a while back called the Cheeseburger Theory of Power. <laughs> I was wanting so badly to have an opportunity. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 you, can, yeah, yeah, you can do it again. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> and there's gonna be no, no. We're, I mean, it's it's you, you get you get trapped on an, on an island with one other person, and you find a crate of cheeseburgers, and there's a hundred cheeseburgers in there, and I give you two. Oh, well, is this a thought experiment? Sure. Okay. Well, um, we can put you on a desert. Yeah, I mean, island. Island. Oh, okay. I, 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 you do, can send you to a desert island. I do island have with this like island burgers. that I'm not using. We're expanding but, our budget. <laughs> but the but the, the the point is is that when 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 you have eaten your cheeseburgers, your two cheeseburgers, and you come and ask me for a cheeseburger, and okay. I say, well, look, if I asked you for a cheeseburger, you would say no. Like, that's true. You would do that. But our situations are not equivalent. 
I mean, these students were unwelcome in this particular space. <laughs> That's a good... But in order to find <laughs> refuge in a space where they were welcome to, As they only had Jewelers. to go to literally anywhere else in their city. You have literally the entire rest of the world and this one room. And the other thing that really bothers me about um, the Ryerson case is that the two journalism students, first off, let's put this into context, like you would not do, uh, you wouldn't go to an AA meeting and report on... No, no like, certainly right? not. And um, however, despite this, the, um, had the student leader of the group that was holding the... Um, Racialized Students Forum mm -hmm. promised those two students that they would get an interview afterwards. Yeah, they, and I can. And they never followed up, yeah. which they yeah. admitted to themselves. They did not follow up with the offer, the generous <laughs> offer for an interview afterwards. And mm -hmm. and there's a uh, my other, my other understanding was is there was the potential that they would have been welcomed in that space if they had actually had experiences of it and they both admit no sorry like that we have never been discriminated against it's like okay in that case we're sorry but this is not a space for you yeah so, and being discriminated against for not having experienced discrimination is not discrimination mm -hmm. we've not suffered it's not a trauma well i feel like i feel like that there's um it comes up in in this this notion um with a, a pro, uh, the sort of the sort of the interaction of privilege and the word racism where um, from a privileged perspective, you understand racism as being mean to other people on the basis of race. And from an oppressed experience, you understand racism as the systemic oppression of people based on race. People of color. People of color. Um, and these, they, they, they do use the same word. But they, they, you know, they mean entirely different things. Mm. And they know that, that it seems like the, con the confusion always happens where people are like, no, 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 I've seen instances where people of color were mean to people based on race. And like, sure, but that, that's not instances of racism. Mm -mm, that's like personal that prejudice. Is not, that is not also, what people, people of color like mean you. when they talk about racism. Mm -hmm. And also, too, like, I have to quote my favorite contemporary prophet, Malcolm X. Um, the black racist is not the same as the white racist. Responding to white supremacy is not racism. It is frustration and anger with white supremacy. Like, they're two mm -hmm. different things. Can I make a book recommendation? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. We'll put it in the show notes. So, I think one of the problems with Race Together and the very, like, white liberal notions that um, being excluded from racialized spaces because you're white is a kind of racism, I think that... Confusion, that clusterfuck, is based on a lack of understanding of what race is. Race, as we use it today, is a concept that arose with modernity. It's not some ancient tradition. It's not something that people of color made up. Um, blackness is a concept that arose with the trauma of European colonization in the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. Prior to that trauma, prior to that brutal event, there was no such thing as blackness. So I think that's why it's so important to get very, very clear on what race is. Because if you're not situating it, if you're not contextualizing it and historicizing what it is you're saying, it's very easy to think that being excluded from a racialized student's group is reverse racism. There's no such thing as reverse racism <laughs> because you did not understand what race was in the first place in order to be able to flip it in your head. I feel like the statement that reverse racism rhymes with is, why did you fail to acknowledge my supremacy? <laughs> so anyways, uh, what's the book recommendation? Oh, right! <laughs> I didn't even recommend a book. Um, so the book um, that I wanted to recommend, it's, it's dense, it's very much an academic text, and I think it's worth the slog. Um, it's called Racist Culture by David Theo Goldberg. Cool. And he defines race and racism as um, a discourse. There's a lot more to it. It's kind of a thick book. But he traces the history of r different concepts of race throughout modernity. And he does an excellent, excellent job of historicizing um, what race is. And I think that if Howard Schultz wants to talk about race, he needs to read some David Theo Goldberg. That's my book recommendation to you, Mr. Schultz. He is a, he is a viewer. 
so it'll be fun. He's a, he's a, I'm sure he watches this. <laughs> but no, yeah, it, it seems like Ra Race Together is exactly the, that, that kind of thing. It's, it's we, you know, it, it is an attempt to have conversations without appreciating or historicizing, especially given that, I mean, Starbucks is a, an organization that takes advantage of people, of marginalized people in other countries. I mean, I don't know who they think picks their coffee. <laughs> People who, like, are paid fairly in order to do the manual labor, and as long as we compensate them with money, there is justice. Duh. It all right. just, it all just really, <laughs> not, you know, it all stems from, but I think some of the confusion, like, this is coming from a person who's white, um, the confusion comes from this assumption, or the unchecked assumption that everybody deserves a voice because everybody's equal. And it, it ignores the, as you were saying, I like that, the historic, historicism, right? Uh, so it ignores the historicism of it that we aren't actually, like, we can treat everybody equally, but we're still not acknowledging the kind of unevenness of the footing, mm -hmm. as, as it were. Um, and that's, that is something that I didn't realize for a long time, that I thought, you know, equality, you know, as long as everybody has the same rights and has the same access and stuff like that, that it, it, that it does same. solve the problem. Same. right. And she's using air quotes. Just, air quotes. Just clear for those same. Of for, for our audio. There, there's an audio. <laughs> um, oh, right. So, so it seems like race together starts with that fundamental assumption that we can, if we just start off with the, the, um, assumption that everybody is the same or we can all talk about it the same everybody's voice is the same you know we can all come at it and we can imagine the plight of the other person for whatever that means yeah. mm -hmm. and then you just take the love child of like apple's red campaign mm -hmm. and social mm -hmm. media collectivism mm -hmm. like, like the, the als ice bucket challenge mm -hmm. works really well we just need a hashtag to trend mm -hmm. so if we take the product apple's red campaign and the collectivism, and mash them together, we've got something that will benefit us and benefit other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, pro mm -hmm. the, problem, the problem with this is it's trying to solve a social problem, not a fund a research problem. Mm. Um, no, I'm not saying the Red Campaign, because the Red Campaign is, there's two sides of it. There's like AIDS research for the medical side of it, but then I imagine there's probably the other side of it. Is it social awareness? There's probably a social awareness <laughs> side of it. That's a very <laughs> large term. <laughs> so we don't even tell to use that term. So, kind of so yeah, I can't think of any any other cases where you have something on this scale trying to be attempted, where you're trying to raise awareness and or like they're not trying to raise dollars, but it wouldn't surprise me if down the line they were going to try to raise money for something to try to address a social problem as opposed to let's raise money for medical research mm -hmm. or let's raise money for relief on this one finite event you know like some disaster that's happened right mm. so it's really weird to try to approach the problem this way yes i, I wonder if it's like, like i mean it, it sort of stems from that notion that that what we really need to do is sort of get along mm. like what happens is sort of born of dislike mm. i mean i mean mm -hmm. in the same way that that, that that people attempt to to solve patriarchy this way it's like well no, no, no. men and women need to just get along like, men and women already get along they get along famously you should just get over it i mean people keep having babies i don't know like, if i that's... like you very much though jim that seems fine <laughs> we can have a conversation about that but uh no it's it but i mean the, the problem is not that people don't get along the problem is that people participate in systems where it doesn't matter if they get along or not some of them are disadvantaged mm -hmm. Right? Like, structural racism doesn't care if you're having a good day or a bad day. It's still going to profile you. Police are still going to profile you when you're walking down the street. Like, racism does not care how you personally identify. You're still going to have... You're, it's still going to be acted upon your body. Mm -hmm. And actually, I wanted to go back. I'm really glad that you brought up this whole thing about if we treat everybody the same. Right? The, this idea that because all people are fundamentally the same, if we come up with a set of universal principles and apply them to all bodies, mm -hmm. then that will be equality. It's like, that's not, that's not how it works. No, that's yeah, not how it works. That's just a carryover from enlightenment thinking that we just, like, white liberal, like, yeah. enlightenment thinking. It really is. It's just, yeah. We just haven't right. found the right set of principles yet for our Wonderland space future. Exactly. What we need to do, it's I, the way I like to look at it is like um, dressing warmly enough for the weather. 
right? You give everybody these universal moral principles are like a 10 by 10 piece of cloth. And everyone who experiences winter is given a 10 by 10 piece of cloth, right? And we expect that because the people who made that cloth find it perfectly warm, everybody needs to find that piece of cloth perfectly warm. And if you need more fabric in order to insulate yourself against the weather, then you're asking for special treatment when in actual fact that fabric was inadequate from the beginning. It was never correct to assume that it could be applied equally to all bodies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is interesting to me how that maps onto rights, but at the same time, um, I... I, I spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time recently doing a bunch of rights-based thinking and, and making a bunch of rights-based arguments, which I haven't entirely written about yet. But and the interesting thing about about it is we, we can we can even in the face of acknowledging equality of, in, in rights, the issue is not that people don't have equal rights. People do all have equal rights. It's that they are they are recognized unequally. I mean things like people's Miranda rights for instance, like even straightforward stuff like that. When you, how often do you get arrested? Do you have a right to privacy? Do you have a right to search and seizure? Thing, you know, or, or to the security of your person? And things like that. Um, do you have a right to leave an altercation alive? In, in a lot of cases, in the last year and every 28 hours. But, I mean, Acknowledge we can we can acknowledge those rights, but acknowledging them like, like acknowledging that people have it, have them is insufficient if they are not practiced, and those rights aren't aren't acted upon by individual people. They're acted upon by uncaring power structures. I mean, we sort of train people and train or and design organizations in that way. Mm. Sometimes it's I find that. We assume the corporation, because it has personhood legally, that, <laughs> that if we treat corporations the way people are, everything's going to be all right. So, for example, you know what? Like, treating everybody equally on a personal level, having what limited power I have, but the power that I have compared to the power a corporation has are two different, you know, levels of power. Like, I try to treat everybody you know, equally with respect and whatnot. Now, I'm not saying that that's perfect because it's still sometimes ignoring or um, distancing myself from context, right? But, like, at the bar, for example, you know, I try to re treat everybody cordially. You know, I try not to discriminate against people and whatnot. But the, the level of responsibility of the individual compared to the corporation, so if you try to take the person and then corporate writ large, if we just treat everybody equally, if we just treat every situation equally, just, you know, throw money at the problem or whatever, that we're doing a good thing. It almost seems like the corporation has more responsibility and yet has no responsibility to try to bear any kind of solution to the problem. Like, as well intentioned as you want to be or as, as much as you want to be a tool for a change, there are certain things that corporation is just not capable of bringing about. Mm. They have no souls to save and no bodies to incarcerate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. true. It is true. And this idea that the battle is going to be fought over corporate spaces as though the problem is that the corporation is not fair enough. Mm. Um, that's not the problem. The problem isn't that corporations aren't good enough to people. The problem isn't that um, they don't pay people enough money. Um, the problem isn't that the police are spending too much time in one neighborhood versus another. The problem is that our livelihoods are contingent upon um, whether or not um, we're going to be compensated monetarily for our labor. And then when you add on top of that this race together thing where you're making people's livelihood contingent upon their emotional labor, when you're putting them into spaces of vulnerability and asking them to perform what is actually um, very specialized work of facilitating conversation about race, and you're asking them to do that without any special training. And if you do do special training, having them... I don't know if you all know this, but Starbucks expects every single drink on their menu 
and every single barista in the store to be able to make every drink that they serve in 36 seconds. You are expected, the standard that Starbucks has is to be able from beginning to end, from picking up a cup to handing it off to the customer, 36 seconds. And if they're planning on maintaining that 36 second span, while also expecting the, the third space that they call themselves to be a space of conversation, critical conversation about race, the, the problem there isn't that the corporation isn't doing enough. The problem there is that the corporation is n misunderstanding its role in society. Welcome to Starbucks, where now we have justice in the drive-thru. <laughs> You've been playing too much uh, yeah, Bioshock. Um, <laughs> but, Sue me. you know what, the other thing is, I just thought of this, is that there is a conflict of interest. The corporation, the bottom line, is as altruistic as you the people in the C-suite, the people who are at the top who set the values for the rest of the company, as altruistic as they are, the bottom line is ultimately the dollar. And it's like, it might be painful to try to admit that, that even the best companies, the ultimate bottom line is always the dollar. It's always, to, not to confuse metaphors, but to keeping things in the black, <laughs> as opposed to keeping things in the red. Um, they're always trying to, to generate profit. And so if they can appear, this is Machiavellian 101, if you can appear to be altruistic while at the same time exploiting your base, like then they're going to do that. They're going to outwardly appear. And I'm not saying that they're sinister, that they're evil in this, but that's just the way, like that's just the way they operate, that they're trying to make money there. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have a campaign that shows that we're socially responsible because customers, we have, I was going to say plate tested. We have um, tested this concept in focus groups, and our customers want this. And our customer, the average person that comes through our door, is of this demographic and has these values and whatnot. If we can appeal to those values, we're going to have people coming, more people coming through our door, whether it's repeat customers or new customers. Starbucks, mm -hmm. because if you buy coffee anywhere else, you're been racist. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good way of framing it. But I mean, the 30 seconds. 36, 36 sec seconds. 36 second coffee window. From makes, picking up the cup to handing it off. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's that's good business. They are share, no, no, I'm talking about the coffee making itself. Mm. They, they have shaved down all the extreme things. They have a formula. You stick to the formula because we know exactly how much each cup costs. We know how much, and that cup, that cup is the materials that go into it, the energy that goes into it, and then the time that it takes. So I'm paying each, like each employee that makes it. It's 30 seconds, 36 seconds of their wages. We know exactly how much that cup's going to cost, and when we charge it, we know exactly how much of a profit we're going to supposed to make ideally. Mm -hmm. And then we fire people who are too slow. Mm -hmm. And so there, that is fundamentally incompatible with trying to bring about any kind of social change or any mm -hmm. kind of um, values-based crusading. I use crusading in a loose sense here, but um, so it's it's almost like it's a flawed premise from the beginning. Almost? Almost. Like? <laughs> I think it completely is. In the, in the <laughs> same way that I hedge my bet and I try to think very or very critically through my answers to my girlfriend when she asked me if I want <laughs> mustard on my sandwich, I'm going to use a very loose phrase there. What are you hedging against? For both the mustard and this. Don't worry in, about the mustards. Focus on this. In Stay. all possible worlds. I thought they were relevantly related. No, in <laughs> all possible worlds... I'm trying to think there could be situations that I'm not thinking about immediately that I would allow my interpretation of events to account or account for those. Uh, you know what? Maybe it is possible that somehow miraculously all the intentions align and every and this campaign works out. But what, I doubt what it. Is, what does working part. out mean? In I don't know. Yeah. I don't. The thing. That's the other thing is, is like, when, when I think about this, what is your success criteria? Exactly, and what that's if, why I don't think you have to hedge your bets. Every, no, 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 no. So everyone in America, everyone in the world, gathers in a circle. <laughs> hand they to hold hand. hold hands. Kumbaya, my lord. God, we're terrible. Kumbaya. Oh, I'm too, Kumbaya. I'm too meek. I lack a, I lack the backbone to be able to make an assertion so bold as to. To sing? So, and so. hold my hand? So the last oh. note, the last note on our show notes is the notion that we need to disabuse ourselves 
of white middle class needs and values and values and, and I mean that really is sort of I think the core of the issue is is Schultz and Starbucks is just like we're we're upper middle class white people we know what you want because we tested it in focus groups <laughs> help us help you I, I, I just I'm, I feel uncomfortable saying that that they are aware of them being like uh, yes, it is. It is just I, it, no, it, no. Like I feel it, but no. Even, 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 even. Like that's even with the best intentions, mm -hmm. with the great, with, with with the like goldest of hearts of gold, which he probably does have. The, the only thing I think I he can, thinks himself to be a good person. Yeah, the only thing I think we can accuse. Well, the only thing I feel like I can accuse him of is being myopic. He his vision. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm being ableist with the language. His understanding of the world around him is too limited. He's not able to grasp the... Because he said it, like, even if people disagree with us, like, we're still going to go... He doesn't seem to... So Socrates, all over it. He doesn't seem to actually understand why it's bad. And it's mm -hmm. not and It's not because... I mean, maybe he is proper German. Maybe it's just like, nah, you know, nah. But, but even, if, like, you know, even if it's, even if it's entirely well-intentioned from the ground up, what it says is, 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 we know what you need, and we will speak for you. I think y'all are both being too generous. Probably. Because, number one, Howard Schultz is not white upper middle class. No. He is rich. white billionaire. He is, I don't even know, like, what's, what's the step above the bourgeois? Who, who sets the norms for the bourgeois? The king. The king! The oligarchs. The, the oligarchs. The yes, he is amongst the head of the oligarchs. He's not white upper middle class. But like I said, I think that a lot of these values are being fueled by the white upper middle class. Mm -hmm. And two, I think y'all are both being too easy on him because I don't think this is a question of him being too well-meaning. Um, and what was it that you were saying that I also disagree with? Uh, you pick one. <laughs> you said something and I also disagree with it. Um, because I think this is a case of culpable ignorance. I think that he has put himself through a series of choices over the past several decades. He has put himself into a position in which he believes that his earnestness is a kind of correctness. And it is a tremendous yeah. amount of privilege. It is a tremendous amount of injustice to believe that because you mean well, you cannot go wrong. That reminds me of an <laughs> SNBC, a Saturday morning breakfast cereal comic. I don't know if it was, came out today or if it was just because it was on the weekend and I always catch up on the weekend where it was somebody was saying, like, I don't understand why heaven is would be so good for everything. It, everything couldn't be good all the time. And the person's like, imagine a place where everybody understood your intentions for every ill-conceived action. He's like, sign me up! Sign me up! <laughs> if I can find it, we'll link it. We'll, we'll link it in the show. It's, it's highly so, relevant here. Like, so we're going to wrap up. Um, if you would like to talk about race in the comments, do so at your own discretion, and but do so by placing it in context and understanding it historically. To help you with that, we have included a number of helpful links and article recommendations in the show notes, both on YouTube and in the show notes for the audio version. So give them a read and uh, learn a bunch of things I certainly have. Can and there be a YouTube link over my face? There can be. If we can find a good YouTube video, I can think of a couple. We'll definitely do that right over AY. Um, you can find more of AY's writing at, where's your website? AYDaring.com. AYDaring.com. And we'll definitely have her on again. So, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm AY. This is where you say, stay awesome. Oh, stay awesome. Like, I feel like so many women have, like, practiced the discomfort of, like, squeezing your thighs. Like, it's a thing. It's a thing that we do. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for for me, I find, and I'm probably just justifying it. Come closer. You're not in the frame. No, I know. We're, that's what we were discussing. Okay. Because my body mass is now eating yours. <laughs>